In this episode of Mind Pump, we wanted to list a few ways that you have to incorporate into your program in order to build strength, like factors. These are the most important factors. You must do these. That will positively influence your strength. Now, why is this important? Because strength is one of the most fundamental things that you should work on. It positively impacts most aspects of your health. And it's something you should focus on, even if your goal is to burn body fat. If you're getting stronger while you're burning body fat, that's a phenomenal sign. So what we did is we listed the most important factors, everything from good form, progressive resistance, uh, free weights versus machines, the best, most effective exercises, whether or not you should get complicated or stick to the basics, how you track, um, whether or not you should train to failure, and whether or not you should phase your workouts. So if you listen to this episode and apply these principles to your routine, the odds that you're going to get stronger effectively and consistently are much higher. Now that brings me to the next point. MAPS Anabolic is one of our most effective strength building programs. Actually, one of our most popular. We programs. did all the work for you. It's uh, it's a if you enroll in MAPS Anabolic, you've got your whole workout planned for you. Everything from what exercises to do to how many reps to the exercise form and technique where we demonstrate the right way to do these exercises. And what we've also done is made this program 50% off in October. So it's half off. So here's what you do if you want to get our most effective muscle building, strength building, metabolism boosting program. Go to mapsred.com and use the code RED50. That's R-E-D-5-0, no space in there for the discount. You brought something up on the show the other day, Sal. So. This is my idea? It is. <laughs> you bring up things. This whole business is your <laughs> idea. Everything's your idea, right? It's Thanks. important. No, you did. You actually, you, you, you brought something up, um, and I think it was along the lines of longevity, but I got a lot of DMs um, in regards to it just about the importance of strength. And I think it's a really good topic. Uh, and personally, for myself, it was something that even as a trainer, uh, years I spent – training for hypertrophy because I, I I aspired to be like a bodybuilder type of physique and I liked that more. It's a muscle growth. Yeah. So I, I was chasing that all the time. And I really, I didn't uh, think I identified with strength athletes and powerlifting. And so for me, I used to think that, oh, that's not for me. So I don't need to train that. But uh, it wasn't until way later in my career did I realize how important strength training is not just for things like being strong or longevity, but just in overall building an aesthetic physique and for all those other reasons too. It's the, it's the it's most foundational. It, yeah. Strength is the, um, it's the foundational physical pursuit. So what I mean by that is I've said this before, but if you get stronger, you improve in almost every other physical aspect uh, or expression of physicality. So what that means is if you get strength properly, you will also improve your functional flexibility. If you get strong properly, you will also improve your stamina and endurance. You will improve your mobility. You will improve your ability to burn body fat, uh, your ability to uh, fight off uh, infection. It gives you general strength. Building physical strength also builds general strength. That's what those studies that you're talking about with longevity, they found that. Strength was a better measure of, uh, was a better protector against all cause mortality mm -hmm. than just muscle mass. And it makes sense, right? Muscle is the, I mean, what does muscle do? It moves. So without the actual function of it, then it's not <laughs> going to provide a lot of uh, actual benefit. But even weight loss, um, if somebody's trying to burn body fat or, or, or lose weight, one of the best possible signs I can think of, one of the most objective, it's objective. I like that because it's, you're either stronger or you're not. But one of the best signs you could ever get is that you actually get stronger while getting leaner. Like if this happens, because here's one of the problems with getting leaner or burning body fat, your metabolism starts to adapt to weight loss by slowing itself down. It's called metabolic adaptation. It's a very, it's a well-documented phenomenon that happens in the body. Well, getting stronger, whenever I have somebody that I'm training or working with and they're saying, hey, I'm, I'm burning body fat, um, you know, am I doing the right thing? And one of the first things I say is, 
are you still getting stronger? Mm-hmm. If they say yes, I'm like, everything's going great. Yeah, because otherwise, if you're going in that direction and you're feeling weaker and you're feeling less energetic, I mean, your body's going to want to shuttle in calories to try and pep you back up again. So it's like you're fighting this other battle at it's the just, same time. It's just a great sign, and I don't care what your goal is. If you're lifting weights, and now, of course, there's extreme expressions of this. Adam brought up powerlifting. Um, yes, you can go extreme with it and then get what are called, you know, diminishing returns. But other than that, I'm talking about for just generally speaking, if you're working out in the gym and using weights, weights, which you should, if you're for what, I don't care what you're training for, uh, that should have play some role in your training. If you're lifting weights, the most important, uh, factor that you should pay attention to is how strong you are. Well, this mm-hmm. is, this is the part that I wanted to kind of go deep on because, Sometimes I think we forget, because we're constantly talking to our peers and in our little bubble, that something as simple as telling people, oh, you should lift weights to build strength, that that computes to the average person as, okay, I just go lift weights, Mm because lifting weights does help build strength. No matter how you lift the weights, lifting weights, period, is going to help build strength. Mm -hmm. So we just assume that every way of training or all, all the basics of lifting weights may contribute to the best ways to building strength and there's better ways to build strength than other ways totally and more effective and faster and i think that we should break down some of the most key and important things to make sure that you build strength the right way and the safest way and the fastest way no that's a great point because you can uh, y- y- there's some truth to saying that if you just lift weights that you're going to build some strength. Obviously, if you go radically wrong and do it completely wrong, then that's not going to happen. But like anything applied properly and appropriately, it's going to get, it's just going to be much better. There's just going to be faster, better, and more consistent results done. The further away you move away from uh, the best way, the best ways to use weights to build strength, the further away you move from that, the worse your results become, um, the less consistent they become, and the higher the risk of, uh, of things like injury become. So that's a very, very good point. And so I think we should list like the most important factors when it comes to resistance training in order to build strength. Like, what are some of the things that are um, non-negotiables? Like, this is a this is imperative well, when it comes to building strength. The first one that comes to mind that I think a lot of people neglect, and I think we should touch on first, is good form. Mm. Uh, and and really working towards having good mechanics and good behavior in the gym when it comes to training. Uh, and this uh, takes a bit of education. It does. So I mean, uh, in 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 terms of like understanding what good posture is to begin with, and like spinal alignment, and then also you know the actual intent and purpose of the exercise. That's going to take a lot of education to get to the point where you understand that fully. Right, because you could do an exercise and then change your form so that you're not having a full range of motion or you're using momentum um, or you're you're going off form and then lift more weight and you could say to yourself, "I'm stronger." Not really. Um there's an optimal way to do exercises, and that optimal way is measured by risk prevention, maximum benefit. Okay, so there's a there's a a great there's a one way to do an exercise perfectly. There's a trillion ways to do it wrong, or to do it less than perfect. So good form is really about doing an exercise in the best way possible. And if you get stronger doing it in the best way possible, then you know you're actually increasing your strength. You're not just lifting more weight. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. It's like if I go to if I go to a squat and I do a full range of motion squat and then I add weight to it and now I don't go down all the way in my squat. I've lifted more weight. <clears throat> Have I really gotten stronger? Mm. No, I haven't. Not at all. So form has got to be imperative. Uh, and that's important because I think sometimes when we communicate getting stronger, especially to guys, I was one of these guys, Especially as a teenager, yeah, you're just purely measuring the weight. I'm just looking yeah. at the weight. Yeah. So now I'm like, you know, right. back comes off the bench or 
don't go down as deep in my squats or swing a little bit with no, my curl. You want to establish good habits that are going to last you a lifetime. And, and to be able to do that correctly from the beginning is imperative. So that way, you know, as you build upon this foundation, this strength foundation, you know, you have a lot more options, uh, you know, going forward to where it's not going to head into a situation where it may be detrimental, it may be injury uh, prone. Yeah, well, here, it's, go ahead. it's also like sports. Like if you look at, you know, a golfer, a baseball player, uh, an NBA shooter, like your your technique will really uh, expand how how great you can become at whatever this this the potential is higher. Yeah, the potential. Thank you. The potential is much higher when you lay a very solid foundation and you practice really good form first. Mm -hmm. So. Anybody can come in, the the most uh, green person at lifting could come in, do squats, terrible form, lift and do squats every single week for six weeks, and they will get stronger. Mm -hmm. They will build some strength, 100%. Uh, but somebody who goes in there and maybe spends those six weeks not really worrying about adding load and getting and getting and you know adding weight to the bar as much as getting really good at the form and technique, that person will eventually surpass the other person and building strength long term. I have a great way to illustrate that. Uh, I've used this example before. It's like uh, when you first learn to type on a keyboard, you use your two index fingers and do the hunt and peck, you know, uh, style oh, yeah. of, of typing. And if you did that for a few years, uh, a few months or a few years, you'll you'll get faster and faster with your hunt and peck, uh, hunt and peck, um, you know, technique. Not knowing that a the, the, the real, the best technique to type is the one where you use all your fingers. And when you first start doing that, you might actually be slower because right. you're really good at the the, the I was a hunting fingers. pecker. Right. <laughs> uh, but once you get, but the potential for speed is much higher with the proper form. The same thing goes tr is true with exercise. Here's an example, okay? Or here's, here's another way to illustrate that. So the strength that you gain within an exercise is uh, relatively... Um, it, it's, it's, it's quite specific. Now, there's some general strength that you get from it, but it's quite specific. In other words, if I strengthen my squat going down 16 inches, most of the strength gain I'm going to get from that squat is going to be to that 16 inches. Once I move out of that, that range of motion, I lose a lot of my strength. And the further I move out of it, the more I lose strength. So for, for those of you listening who don't believe me, Go try doing your max squat, but go down two inches lower. You're going to hurt. Your, well, actually, don't yeah, do don't, that. Yeah, don't do yeah, that. Don't, <laughs> don't challenge them. Yeah. They, they will do it. You'll hurt yourself. So good form, what encompasses good form is often or almost always a very good controlled full range of motion. So what happens when you get strong in a full range of motion, which is what good form is, is what's part of good form, is you're going to get a greater range of strength. You're just going to build a greater range of strength. So form is absolutely imperative. The other part of why uh, the other thing why good form is so imperative is good form has been established uh, for you as a uh, the best way to reduce the risk of injury. Getting stronger, there's always that risk of injury as you lift more weight. You know, if I if I move wrong with 100 pounds on my back, there's a certain risk of injury. If I move wrong with 400 pounds on my back, mm. the risk of injury is far higher. Yeah. So good form is extremely important, um, especially as you get stronger. Well, and I, I don't think it's just good form uh, when we talk like good form as far as range of motion. It's also like control in that totally. range of motion and and understanding what muscles we're trying to train when we do the this. Preferable muscles, right? Which ones you want? Yeah, which are ideal for this movement? Because again, you could come in, you could squat, you could you could squat down, get up and have terrible form and still build strength. But what ends up happening is you start to build in areas that are, are that are, should not be taking the, the most of this load and moving this weight most optimally. And then that just exaggerates what you're saying about as you start to load the bar. You get really good at bad form. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Which that, that it just makes the risk go up that much higher. Much not higher. to mention the results go much lower because too, the, the risk, potential of the results. Yeah, and because the risk goes up higher, like you said, uh, now your 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 potential was a 10 and now there's no way you're going to get above a 7 mm -hmm. because your form is off. So that's real important. So the, the, uh, just to, uh, the, the final way to close the loop on this point is, you know, I, I always tell clients at the beginning, as much as it's important for us to add weight to the bar and, and to load and get stronger, it's more important that you you practice this as a skill. And we talk about this on the on the show a lot. Like, Man, sometimes it's great just to go to the gym and for the entire hour practice the skill of squatting. And when you're practicing a skill 
of squatting, you're not loading the bar really, really heavy. You're paying attention to all the detail of your ankles, your feet, where your knees are at, your head, your chest. The tension. Yeah, the tension that you're keeping throughout the movement, the control of it, the tempo of it. And just get good at it. Get good at moving through that range of motion like you were pointing out, Sal, and practice that. Even though you may not think that you're getting stronger or that's great, you're laying a really good foundation for getting really strong totally. in the future. Now, here's another one. I think this one it almost goes without saying, um, but uh, progressive resistance. Um, in order to get stronger, you have to continuously challenge the body. Yep. Your bo And so progressive resistance means... As you get stronger, you add weight and continue to challenge uh, your body. And there's a couple thoughts I have on this. One, um, it doesn't happen perfectly in a linear way. So you're not going to add weight right. always to the bar. It's more of a stepladder approach. You're going to have some weeks where you're going to add weight, and then you're going to have some weeks where you need to drop down, focus on perfecting your form, allow your body to recover, and then start to move back up in that pattern. Yeah, so you can't weigh your results purely on whether or not like you're increasing constantly because there are those moments and there's lots of other factors involved in terms of you know whether you got a good night's sleep like how much stress you're under like there's lots of factors going into the actual workout right. where yeah it may it may limit uh performance that day specifically but it is a good way to to, to measure progress in the overall scheme yeah when i first became a trainer i remember it shocked me to see this but then as i continue training clients i would actually see this uh, not a ton, but I'd see it enough to where I was like, oh, this is a pattern. And this was much more common with female clients, but they'd come to me, they'd want to hire me. You know, we'd talk about working out and they'd say, I'd say, oh, do you work out? Do you lift weights? Oh yeah, I lift weights three days a week. I'm like, okay, let's, you know, let, let me see what your workout looks like. And I'd go through and then they'd grab their 10 pound dumbbells or whatever, or their 15 pound. They say, well, how long have you been using this weight? Oh, the whole time. I'm like, what do you mean the whole time? This is just what I, I, I do 10 pound Chest press. Well, how many reps do you do? 10. 10. Every week. Every single yeah. week. For like, 10 years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Your body will not continue to progress if you do not give it a reason to progress. And that is, and one of the ways to do that, and one of the more important factors is to add resistance progressively. As you get stronger, you add weight or repetitions. That keeps sending a signal to the body to continue to get stronger. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, what will end up happening is whatever weight you start with and initial strength gains come and now it's easy, but you keep doing it, you're at best going to stay where you're at. I'm, you're so, I'm so glad you're bringing this up because that is probably the one of the most common things that I used to get, especially with my, my female clientele, was they found a weight that they could do with good form or that they like to do for an exercise. And that was, they just stuck to that mm -hmm. forever. When I do chest flies, I do these dumbbells. Right. When I do bicep curls, I do these dumbbells. When I do this, I do this machine and I do it on this pen. Like every, and it's like, I've been doing that for months on years, a lot of the time. And it's like, well, yeah, that's going to maintain kind of where you're at right now. But if you're in search of progressing and progressing your physique and building more strength, I mean, you've got to slowly add weight to the bar. Totally. Now, on the flip side of this, uh, here's something that I would see that was more common in my male clients. They were adding resistance when it wasn't time. Way too fast. To add resistance. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, you added five pounds to the bar, but your form went to crap. Yeah. Um, that's not appropriate either. It's usually a, let's see what I can do. Like that, <laughs> yeah. That's really like the mentality coming in instead of having a real methodical approach that's going to like uh, give you the right dose that's going to help you to actually progress as opposed to, well, now I have to heal. Yeah, you ever get those clients where the guys, you know, they do a, a set and you're watching their form, you're like, oh, it's a little iffy. They pushed it and then they add, add more. Yeah, <laughs> I think I could do the 45s. Actually, you can't, John. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can't yeah. do the 45, so let's stay yeah, away from that. Isn't that, coming back. isn't that funny how we are at the opposites of the sex? Like so if we can blend the two of them, you make like the perfect client. Oh, totally. Right. Actually, I'll be honest with you. Women are easier to train typically than, than yeah. Oh, yeah. Than well, because I've, I would they always rather better. have somebody who has been training uh, with more caution yes. and control yes. and it created at least good – because my, the female client that you addressed, that client actually a lot of times has decent to good form. Mm -hmm. That's what she's they been, focus on. She's been practicing. That. Yeah, she's yeah. been practicing That's with those fifteen-pound dumbbells for years, doing the same exercises. She's got pretty good mechanics. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Where the guy, he may be doing five times yeah. the weight as she's doing, but he's all over the fucking map. And <laughs> I got symmetrical. And, and it's tough because you got to take him. And, and not, I mean, it's so challenging having a male client that you have to strip them down. 
Oh boy, what a hit and, to the ego. Right. And yeah. you got to tell them, and they're telling you, I can do more. Uh, well, yeah, I know you can do yeah. more. I but normally do two plates. Right. Uh, you should be doing a half, right. half a plate. Right. <laughs> you know, um, so stripping them down. Yeah. So add weight, but stick to the first principle we talked about, which was good form. If your form is still good, then you can, and you add weight, excellent. You've progressed, and that's going to send more of a signal to continue to build strength. Um, those are very, very fundamental. Um, what about this one? Um, in my experience, the best f exercises to build general, overall, real world effective strength are free weight exercises. Yes, if I had yes. to pick, now I, I don't. Now here's the deal: I'm not saying only do free weights. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying that. No, but there is a hierarchy. There is. We have to acknowledge it. And free weights just do a better job of building um, overall general strength. Well, and, and studies show this. You get really good at a barbell squat, um, your sprint speed and your vertical gets better than if you do a machine squat, for example. They just translate much better. Part of it may be the balance factor. Um, I, I think a lot of it has to do with just this, the difficulty of them. I mean, I have been consistently squatting and deadlifting now more so than I ever have in my life in the, in the last probably six or so years. And I mean, very consistent. I'll easily miss bicep curls and lateral raises for weeks on end, but I won't miss squatting or deadlifting longer than, I think the, I think I'm on a long, one of my long streaks right now. I think I'm on day six, I haven't squatted or deadlift. Like that's, I've been extremely consistent with it. The point of me sharing that is I am still, trying to perfect the form. I'm still working to get better at it. There's so there's so many nuances with the squat, the deadlift, the overhead press. These movements are so complex that there, there's somewhat of novelty still to them, even to this day, even mm -hmm. to the, all those times and reps I put into it, where when you sit in a machine that takes out a lot of these other things, like it doesn't take long for the body to adapt to this restricted movement and get, get good at it. And right. then my only tool to progress it is to just overload it by adding weight where the deadlift or the squat or the overhead press there's so, like i said so many nuances to the movement that i can be practicing all these little details and improving it and that gives me more room i think to progress i think that's a lot of the reason why and free weights are you know we're talking about all the benefits of strength free weights are also more like real life mm -hmm. in real life when you're lifting something it's not on a track right you know, it's not on a cam it's or not whatever. It's clean and clear cut. And it, yeah, there's a lot more variables that you have to be like flexible and on the fly with. Like, how do I, how do I account for this uh, asymmetrical load? Like something that's like shifting weight, even as I'm picking it up, like I have to be able to resist that. And that's a whole different skill. That's right. And earlier in the episode, we talked about form and I'll tell you what, when you use a machine, oftentimes you have to adjust your body to fit the machine because the machine is built within a certain parameter. In fact, the last time I, I read about this, I think most machines are designed for a average, I think, 30-year-old male who's five between 5'8 five, to 5'10 or something like that. So, And that's when they have adjustable seats and arms and all that stuff. But still, you're limited. Free weights adjust to your body. You put the free weight on your body or you move the free weight in space. That's why it's called free. So I don't care how tall or short or wide you are or how long your femurs are or how long your arms are. The free weights match your body. I mean, you got a guy like Adam who's got long limbs, um, wide shoulders. You put him in a machine and he has to like figure out a way to get the machine to work his body properly. You don't got to do that with free weights. No. You just have good form and it works. You know, when I would train clients that were a little short, um, I would put them in a machine and sometimes I do the machine and be like, all right, it's not going to work for you. We'd move the seat all the way up. Mm -hmm. It's not now that the person wouldn't know this because they're not a trainer. So they would go and use the machine and end up, uh, not being able to maximize their progress. Free weights are not like that. Free weights. I can train anybody with free weights. I can modify the hell out of free weights. You can't do this with machines. And I think because of this fact that it fits your body better, um, you're going to get better general strength gains as a, as a result. So if we're talking about, again, strength, and you want that, you know, that specific but also general strength, free weights just crush, uh, they absolutely crush machines. And athletes have known this for a long time. You, you don't see too many athletic coaches primarily train their clients or their athletes on machines, but you get almost all of them 
primarily training their 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 athletes uh, with free weights. Yeah. They're just much better. And the strength you build with a, I'll tell you something right now, adding fifty pounds on a leg press is not the same as adding fifty pounds on a barbell squat. No, it's just not. You add fifty pounds on a leg press, yeah, you get stronger. That's cool. You add fifty pounds on a barbell squat, you can feel it. It feels like it's like adding one hundred and fifty pounds on a on a leg press or something like that. Far, far more uh, carryover overall to the type of strength that you build. Well, that that leads me to the next point, which is the importance of incorporating the big four and sticking to the big four. Oh, the ba- the best exercises. Yes, in, in a routine. I I remember when we first launched Maps Anabolic. And if there was anything that we ever got pushback on, it would be people going like, I already know these exercises. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? You remember that? Yep. Yeah. You remember people being like that? Yeah. And it's this is this like is like there's a secret exercise right. or something that's and, gonna and it, and it really it frustrates me and, and it frustrates me because it's a reflection of myself, right? I, I know that I was part of the problem as a trainer early on in my career. I I train clients and with the wow factor of let me show you an exercise you've never seen before and you know dazzling them with these crazy balancing type movements and st- sitting weird and standing weird and using machines differently and all this stuff to try and get their attention that let me show you something new that you've done all while not knowing that I was really doing more harm than good because my clients were missing out on the the movements that are going to give them the greatest bang for their buck mm. and not avo- not only not avoiding them is or avoiding them is ridiculous but not keeping them in your routine as a regular movement that should stay in there probably forever. Yeah, mm-hmm. now the big four that Adam's referring to are your barbell squat, your barbell deadlift, your barbell bench press, um, and your barbell overhead press. Those mm-hmm. are the big Now the reason why they're called the big four is because of this. You I could take those four exercises and I'll compete better. I'll win over any combination of 20 other exercises you could think of. Mm-hmm. No joke. You pick up 20 other exercises and, uh, and, and, and no cheating, no using exercises that are almost identical. You can't be like, okay, I'm not going to bench press with a barbell, but I'll use dumbbells. Yeah. Eh, that's too simple. Right, I'm going to do a Bulgarian squat to yeah. the squat. No, no, no. I, I'm talking about like exercises that are way different. Those exercises, those four, will destroy in terms of just overall strength, meat. muscle building, fat loss, and progress over all those other exercises. You get really good at a barbell squat. Um, that's better than doing leg extensions, leg curls, abduction, adduction, um, and any other combination of leg exercise you can think of uh, for most people. Now, I'm not saying you, you, you know, if you don't squat, you're, some people can't do some of these exercises. I get that, but most people can and those that can't should figure out a way to be able to do those exercises and correct imbalances and figure out why the hell they can't do some of these these fundamental movements. But these exercises just have by far the biggest bang uh, for their buck. Yeah, um, and they're all they're all high skill. I mean, and that's to your point of always learning and always like uh, revisiting these very specific exercises. There's just so many nuances and so many things to pay attention to. And and feedback that you're going to get provided while doing these exercises that, you know, little things can can then lead you down to accessory lifts. Like I need to improve this part of my body because of what's happening in one of these uh, gross motor movements that I'm working on. Mm-hmm. Like it, it reveals itself as you're going through the exercise. Yeah, for most people listening, and of course, there's always individual variants, but I can make this uh, statement a lot of confidence. Most people listening right now, if you're lifting weights, I don't care what your goal is, if you're lifting weights, you should have those four exercises in your routine weekly. Yes. Or almost weekly at the least, right? But probably weekly. They should definitely be in there. You can modify and change everything else. You can throw in exercises, take others out. You can change the rep ranges and do a bunch of other things. But those exercises belong in most people's routines Pretty regularly. That's how important these exercises are. Not all exercises are created equal. Some exercises are far more effective than others. I mean, if you're going to spend 20 minutes in the gym, you don't want to spend that 20 minutes doing stuff that's not effective. Heck, if you want to spend an hour in the gym, you want to you want to spend it getting the most out of that hour. 
those four exercises well, they have, do the most. They have the most carryover to all other exercises. Very true. There's a lot of things that you can do. You can get amazing at lying leg curls and progress your strength, this and that, and then go grab a barbell deadlift and be terrible at it, mm -hmm. right? But the but, reverse. But the reverse, and I've shared this example on this show, I'll never forget how much it blew my mind. I completely eliminated lying leg curls for a year and did nothing but deadlift, came back to lying leg curls, and it was PRing the first time I did it. I'd done it two times the weight that I was doing before. It was just blew my mind. And the same thing went for exercises like a seated row. Seated row was something I'd used to do at first back exercise. If I wasn't doing pull-ups, I was doing seated row to warm up every single back, uh, every single back day. Completely eliminated that for almost a year. Deadlifted like crazy. Came back to seated row. Stronger in seated row I've ever been in my life. I could have seated row my whole life, then go to deadlifting. Does nothing for me. Mm -hmm. So those four those four movements carry over, and this goes for everything too, like bicep curls and tricep extensions and all these other movements. When you do a, a heavy overhead shoulder press or a bench press, the shoulders and the triceps are, are getting work. When you're doing a pull on a, on a deadlift, especially when you're pulling two, three, 400 pounds of weight, the biceps are getting worked. They're going to get stronger. So then when you go to those other movements, you're going to see carry over to them. You'll get mm -hmm. stronger in all those secondary muscles. But if all you train is all these isolation exercises and you target specific muscle groups and you eliminate those four and then you go try and do one of those four big movements, you won't see shit from oh, it. Oh, no. I mean, for as long as people have been lifting weights, certain exercises have risen to the top. And now we've had people lifting weights consistently now for six, seven decades, uh, a lot of strength athletes and athletes you know, in other sports and bodybuilders and all that stuff. And this is a pretty wide... Uh, accepted consensus that those are the four, uh, those four exercises. That's why they're called the big four, right? They're they're some of the most effective exercises. So this is based off of the experience of decades of athletes training and people noticing, like, wow, when I get really strong at a squat, uh, my progress is amazing. That my body looks incredible. I build more muscle, way more than when I get strong at other leg exercises, and that's true for all of them. Uh, which brings us to the next thing: stick to the basics. Um, strength is built by getting good at the most, uh, at, at the basics at getting good at the most effective exercises. If you're, th if you're constantly throwing crazy variety of, uh, of exercises at your body, if you're balancing on, I remember for, for a while there, it got really popular to stand on a balancing ball or do everything one legged or do weird, you know, versions of diff different exercises. You're not going to get you. You're not going to be good enough at those to get to build lots of general strength like you would with some of those other basics. Keep it basic. There's some basic principles that apply to building strength. Um, stick to those. When you get super creative, uh, the body actually doesn't doesn't progress very well. It starts to stall. You're throwing too many variables um, at your body. And you know, we were teasing our friend the other day, uh, Mike Matthews. Uh, yeah. And it's funny because we were like we were teasing him about how boring his workouts are. But after a few minutes of teasing him, we also you know chuckled and said the truth is you're doing the most effective stuff. Yeah, the stuff that he's putting out there and he's posting on his Instagram uh, stories is better than ninety percent of the shit that you see trainers out there posting. You know the the thing that you see, especially in social media world, uh, you see these trainers always showing and teaching the new creative exercise. Try this out. Yeah. You know, use this, check this out. Look at this new move. Look at this fancy thing. It's like, you know, the reason why I don't like that stuff, it's not that having some creative new way to work your triceps or do some cool shoulder, you know, superset isn't neat. What I know is that I've trained the general population for a really long time. And most people don't even need that, those tips and that advice. Most people need to be reminded how important they are that, that they stick to the basic movements mm -hmm. and get good at the basic movements and that's not that easy mm -hmm. you know you could you could practice a lunge a squat a deadlift an overhead press a, a, a chest press you could you could barbell press you could do that for the next 10 years and still never get perfect at it mm -hmm. so stick to those basic movements and continue to try to progress and get better and get better and that will give you way more carryover than this whole muscle confusion idea oh, yeah. of lot, throwing lot random of specificity. stuff. Right. And I mean this is this is something that's been sort of an abused statement too, but if you look at what 
uh, you know, you're teaching the body. I'm refining that and I'm getting better and better at these movements that have the most carryover. That's why we're, we're sticking with those in the mix. And then every now and then it's good to throw an interrupter in mm -hmm. and, and that's going to create a new stimulus, but you're always drawing it back to these, these core exercises because they have, you know, the most effect on your overall strength. It's, it's, you know, this is, one of the best compliments I ever got on MAPS Anabolic was uh, its strength coach uh, told me the beauty was in its simplicity. Uh, MAPS Anabolic, and don't let that fool you, the, uh, the way that program is written, a lot of thought and energy went into creating this program to be as effective as possible. But if you don't understand training, you look at it, you think, wow, this is a lot of basics. And it's true. It's because... They work. Yeah, uh, yeah, it works. The, the, yeah, the idea wasn't to create a program to, to, to razzle and dazzle people. The idea was to create a program that worked. And be, the basics work. Uh, if you apply them properly, and there's definitely complexity in how you apply the basics. So, you know, when I say the basics, that doesn't mean, you know, it's easy. Uh, but there's, so there's definitely complexity there. But when you stick to the basics and you do it right, you'll get way better results than when you throw a million and one different variables to your body. I mean, look, here, here's a good example. You look at a boxer. How many punches does a boxer have in his arsenal? Yeah, four. Jeez, yeah, was, four yeah. or five. Yeah, yeah like four or five punches, right? You got a, you know, some guy who's you know a, a black belt in some martial art that's got 50 million different moves and kicks, and then he goes and gets in the ring with a boxer who's been practicing those four punches for the last five years. The boxer's going to beat the crap out of him. Bruce Lee said it. Yep. He says, I, I don't fear the man who knows a th who's practiced a thousand kicks one time. I, I, I fear the man who's practiced one kick a thousand times. Right. Very, very true uh, when it comes to resistance uh, training. Now, We're there's there's another one that I found that is, was extremely important um, to me. Like I, I remember, again, training for a really long time, you know, always just building a bot, trying to build my body. I cared about the way I looked. I was never a strength athlete. So I never followed like a powerlifting protocol to progressively add strength week over week. And even though I understood progressive overload, I never really tracked. I never really tracked everything to see like, am I actually putting it in and, and, mm. and, and slowly increasing my volume or slowly increasing my weight week over week or month over month. And I didn't do this, uh, uh, complete transparency to to the level that I did. I did kind of when I was younger, but not to the level that I did here as I did when I started competing. Because now I had to, right? Here I am. I'm, I I do a show. I, I work real hard training and dieting. I get out there. I present my physique. And, you know, I, my first show, I got fourth place. So next show, I want to win. I want to do better. Well, if I want to do better, I can't go back and do the exact same routine or follow the same formula that I, I was doing to get to that physique, I needed to be able to overload it. Mm -hmm. And the only way I would know for sure that I was overloading it would be if I was to be tracking it and paying attention to it. And one of the things that I noticed when I first started tracking was what would what kind of naturally happens, and this is my theory on why a lot of people get stuck in plateaus. Um, this is I, and this is why this one's so important to me. Is I think just with nat, just natural habit, this is what we do, you know, because a lot of people don't track. You have a week, and it's a good week. You you, you hit your four days or however many days you plan to whatever is a good week for you of training. You know, three five mm -hmm. days in in the gym. And you ate well, you slept well, you train great. You know, you hit that extra set when you were going to go home or you push a little extra harder, you add a, five more pounds because you're feeling good. And that, and you do that for a week, then you do it for a second week and, oh man, maybe you hit a PR and you're feeling great. And then the next week after that, like it's just, you're busy. You're busy or you didn't sleep as well. And so then you go in and you train and you kind of, you, you, you don't even realize it, but you do one less set that that workout. And then the next one, you can't quite load at the bar as much, so you pull back about 10 pounds. And then the next week after that, you know, another crazy week or whatever, and you don't feel as motivated, you don't have your workout partner. And so then the volume dips, you know, and then the next week of that, you go back up again. And then you, we all, we kind of hover in this comfortable zone and we kind of stay there and we don't progressively overload over time. And I noticed that I was doing this, and so when I was tracking, it caught it, it caused me to be very diligent about 
how much I load it. And knowing that I don't need to do a lot more and, and that there's a sweet spot because you don't, and sure. that's the other thing people go. Cause you can look at the big picture, right? You could look at it at a month or weeks it, rather than just the last workout. Exactly. And so I think everybody else treats it like they're on or off, they're hot or cold. Either I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not training very hard or well, and then I'm training really hard, really well. And it's kind of the same thing. You're off or you're on and off looks like X amount of weight and volume and on looks like another, another one versus methodically adding a little bit of weight every single week over week over month and, over and month we're creatures of habit i mean we're the path of least resistance is this is human behavior so right. there's you know there's times where i'm in the gym and i know like this is my my favorite lift this is what i'm good at lift right versus the one that's going to be the struggle always and i'm like yeah like we'll just naturally avoid if i'm not consistently like writing it down or looking at like what the plan is for the day i will avoid things like like unconsciously. Yeah. At first glance, uh, when you say track uh, as an important um, you know, factor to building strength, at first glance, I'm like, is it really? And then I think about it. I think about all the clients that I train. Now, I tracked oftentimes when I would train clients. When I train myself, maybe not as much. But when I train clients, I would track. And here's what would end up happening. I'd have a client do an exercise. And they'd be like, phenomenal. You did two more reps. They'd be like, I did? Yeah. I, that's I thought that's how much I always did. Or do an exercise like, oh my god, you use the fifteen pound dumbbells. Uh, that's the ones I always use. I'm like, no, it's not. You used the twelves before. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an important way to self reflect. And I think you're right, Adam, to look at the big picture because you're not going to progress your resistance every single week. So mm -hmm. it is important to look at the big picture because this week over last week I may go lighter because I'm not feeling as good. But when I look at the big picture, I see, wow, my dips aren't as low as they used to be. Now when I drop weight, I'm still stronger than I was when I was at my strongest two months ago. So that tracking just gives you that bird's eye view that I think long term uh, that is necessary for long term success. Well, it's the same thing that uh, the same way that I would approach uh, a client with their nutrition. You know, uh, clients used to always, oh, I'm eating good, I'm eating so good, I'm eating perfect, I'm following the plan, this and that. And I'd be like, okay, well, show me. Did you write it down or did you track it in your app or whatever? And Oh no no no! I I I'm eating what you tell me. Like oh okay. How do you know? How do you know? Let's yeah. let's track. And then what would happen? They would track, and then I could see all the holes. Mm -hmm. Oh well, here on this day we we way under eight on your protein that we were supposed to. Oh this day we didn't get enough fiber like we're supposed to. Mm -hmm. This day you overconsumed by two hundred and fifty calories. You didn't realize you did. Like all that shit fucking matters. And there all of that could be. And what's the 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 human nature to Justin's point? We do. We just we're creatures of habit. And we just kind of fall into these natural behaviors. And those natural behaviors, a lot of times, result in these plateaus because you think you're doing one thing, but you're kind of naturally gravitating towards your normal behaviors. And one of the easiest ways for me to point that out with someone's programming or training is to have them track. And then I can look at it. And I'm like, well, look, over the four weeks that you were consistently tracking, you actually averaged the same volume every single week. Right. So in the grand scheme of things, we're really not progressively overloading. Right, we're, we're, right. we're staying about the same. Sure, you had a great week right here, but then you had a shitty week right here. It averages out to be this. Now, don't fall into this trap uh, when you track that you have to beat your numbers from last week every right, single right. week. Don't mm -hmm. fall into that trap. Look mm -hmm. at the big picture. That's how you use tracking properly. The way you use tracking improperly is last week I did 10 reps. I have to do more this week. At some point, that'll cause problems for you. All right, right. here's one that blew my mind the first time I actually learned and applied this. In fact, if I think of all the singular mind-blowing things that I learned in resistance training, this next one I'm about to mention is in the top three, definitely top five, but probably top three. Might even be the number one thing that blew my mind, and that was to not train or lift to failure. God, I love, I love this one because – the state that we're in, in the fitness space, the beast mode, the all out, everybody's chasing PRs, the CrossFit mentality of exercise and lifting weights. We're always chasing this muscle failure and, and going after that. So, and this was, I'm right with you on this, Sal. This was an area that I abused this for most of my training career. And it was a very tough thing for me to, to learn this two in the tank Theory. Oh, dude, it was a, it was a, the reason why it blew my mind is because this was a it was a staple. It was a commandment that in order to get your muscles to grow or to you for you to get stronger, 
Yeah. You had to lift a weight until you could no longer... As much as possible. Yeah, you could no longer lift it again with good form. So if I'm bench pressing, the 10th rep has got to be the absolute last rep I could possibly do because the theory went, then you know that your muscles, uh, that you surpass the point where you send the signal to build muscle. You know that you're going to send that signal. It creates the most damage. And therefore, every always train and lift to failure. And so I just assumed... This was a law. And so I trained like this for the first 10 years of my training career, at least 10 years. That's how I yeah. trained my body. And then I started to read the studies and papers on Olympic lifters. Now, here's why reading this was so important. Olympic lifting has got the most science uh, supporting it in terms of uh, training methodologies. A lot, a lot of this is because Olympic lifting is an Olympic sport. So there's a lot of countries that fund studies. From, a lot of this comes from Russia, right? A lot of it came from the Soviet Union, right? They invested a lot of money on trying to make the best, strongest athletes in, in Olympic lifting. And the way Olympic lifters train rarely is to failure. In fact, one of the only times they ever lift to failure is on the day of competition. No. Um, power lifters also. Power lifters rarely lift to failure. So when you look at these strength athletes, I remember reading this going, huh, yeah. that's kind of weird. And so here's what I started to do. I, I'm like, all right, let me test this out. Rather than lifting to failure, I'm going to stop about two reps before I fail. No joke. Instantly got stronger. Instantly. The next workout, I got stronger on lifts that I had been stuck at Yeah, this for totally years. blew my mind, too. I, and again, looking back at, at the training, and I used to know a couple Olympic lifters, and they're kind of breaking down how they trained and and it was like seven days a week it was every single day they're training and so to to think that they were trying to max out every single workout was Wouldn't just work. like idiotic yeah and it it's and they just were trying to tell me like how much they had to work at this skill and, and they had to treat it like they're practicing this skill constantly constantly and then they would challenge it and they would they would stress their body by by upping the load on a day, but then making sure they're still going through those movements again with light load. So it was really just about that management. That management of stress was key, and having the right dose was everything. Well, we didn't put this up here as a point, but I feel like this falls in the same category, and that's the frequency is king. Thing. Sure, yep. and that that was you know I used to be in that category of guys that trained where they hammered a, a, a single muscle group for a, you know one time that week i'm doing 15 to 20 sets in it and i'm going to failure and then i don't touch it again for another week where when i started to pull pull back from the failure training it allowed me to hit that muscle group two times and then three times and i remember it was like a it took me a while to really really learn it because i kind of scaled back like i didn't go to crazy failure and then i went to like almost kind of yeah, failure yeah. but still was training quite a bit of volume and it was like, okay, that's reduced my soreness. I can actually hit the muscle again a second time the week. But God, Jesus, if I'm going to do three times a week, I've got to really pull this back. And it was a, a mental struggle to go in the gym and do only five to eight sets of chest and then call it a day. Like mm -hmm. it was and just- And not to failure. Yeah, especially when for 10 years of your, your training career- You've trained a way to where you know you do that last at least the last set, if not every set, to absolute failure, and then to go like, oh, I'm only going to train five to eight sets, and not only am I only going to train five to eight sets, but I'm also going to leave two in the tank, and I'm going to leave training my chest for the day feeling like it's not destroyed, like this doesn't feel right. No. But to your point, Sal, holy shit, did the strength start to pile on when that when that light bulb went off and I, I pulled back on the intensity I increased the frequency and I focused on on this this was and focused on not training to failure just blew my mind oh studies support this by the way there's, there's there's a few studies now that show that train to failure is too much intensity most of the time and that when people train to failure they actually progress slower than if they stop about two to three reps short of fa failure it's a good rule of thumb. Now, I'm not saying you should never train to failure. Every once in a while, lifting a weight until you can't lift it anymore with good form might be beneficial. Part of the reason, main reason why I think it's beneficial is not necessarily because it makes you stronger, faster, 
but because it lets you, it re, it helps you re-gauge uh, where it's a good two benchmark. reps. Yeah, like where two reps before it's that is. It's a tool. It's a tool like everything else we talk about. It should be used intermittently in your training routine. Yeah, I think and for the most part, most people shouldn't. No, and it, in fact, you don't ever have to. No, no, no. You could, you could train your whole training career and never train to failure and build a ton of muscle, burn a ton of body fat, and build a ton of strength. Dude, this is not an exaggeration. So again, this is roughly 10 years, 10 to maybe 12 years of, of, of my training career. So I'm like 27 or 26, you know, maybe even more, right? Because I started lifting weights at 14. So I'm like 26, 27. I remember kind of late 20s. And now consider this. It's very difficult to gain lots of muscle and strength after you've been training consistently for 10 years. At that point, it's really hard to get the body to continue progress, right? Very incremental at that point. Very, very slow. Like you gain a couple pounds of muscle a year after 10 years of training, like you're kicking butt, right? Especially because I did a lot of my training through the, the the teen and early 20 years where you've got the most testosterone and all that stuff. I went from lifting to failure all the time to stopping two reps short. I gained seven pounds. Seven pounds of muscle came on my body like I was like when I first started lifting weights and my strength went through the roof. I remember telling my cousin, who had also been he was been he'd been lifting weights at this point probably for five years consistently. He didn't believe me. Luckily, I'm a good salesman. And I closed him on it. He did the same thing. He gained six pounds of muscle the following month. I remember because we would go back and forth and he would tell me, I gained three pounds. I gained five pounds. My strength is going through. I'm like, I told you, going to failure is it one of the most terrible lessons that I think we, that people were taught in the lifting weights community. And it's, uh, it's actually, not only is it not necessary, it's actually detrimental uh, for most people. Okay, here's another one. Phasing. Phasing your training. Here's a rule of thumb when it comes to all forms of exercise, but especially true for resistance training. Most things work. Nothing works forever. Yeah. Right. Nothing works if you just keep doing the same thing over and over again. Um, all rep ranges, most rep ranges, between one to about 25 reps can build strength and build muscle. Okay, So all those rep ranges have validity. All of them have value. If you stick to one rep range all the time, your body will stop progressing in a hurry. Not only do they have value, but I want to add that whatever rep range you haven't been doing the longest will probably add the most value. Mm -hmm. So if you're somebody who loved the the burn and the pump and you're constantly in that 12 to 20 rep range and supersetting – the single best thing that you could probably do to build strength is dropping down to that one to five range. It will blow your mind. And the same thing is true for someone who only lifts in the one to five rep range or below six reps, and that's yeah. how they always train. Yeah, bring them up to 12. Oh, bring them up to 15 to 20. It'll blow their mind. Blow their mind. Absolutely. Yeah. Remember Stan Efferding was on the show. Uh, Stan Efferding is, uh, is known. Right. He swears by the 20s. The He's squat, super, squatting to 20. Super strong guy, power lifter, whatever. Hired Flex Wheeler to get him to, to so he could win his first bodybuilding competition. All Flex did was be like, we're going to do the 12 to 20 reps. We're going to move away from the low reps. And what ended up happening, mm -hmm. he actually got stronger and, and built more muscle, was able to win his, I think he won his pro card. Mm -hmm. Um, and his body progressed. Yeah, this uh, speaks again to to the tracking point. I think you know previously uh, paying attention to uh, what you've been doing, like over the last you know week to months to like it's it's really imperative that you know you're paying attention to all these different uh, trends and 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 where you are in terms of progressing within that type of a phase and when to phase out. So I think one of the hardest things to do is to phase out before you hit that plateau. Which totally we found. true. Totally yeah. true. And now, this phasing is a in, integral component of all MAPS programs, but it's, it was definitely it was part of the first one, MAPS Anabolic. When, when that one was created, I made sure to put in there that people would train for a few weeks within a particular rep range and move out of it into the next rep range. This is one of the best insurances you have to continual progress. If you want to get your body to progress consistently – one of the most important things you do is phase your training. Yeah. One, of the, one of the worst things you could do, if you want your body to plateau, here's what you do. Same rep range. Yeah, forever. Stay, stay in the separate, same rep range. Uh, at, at some point, it'll stop working, and it stops working fast. Like, whew, that's it. No more progress. My body's not progressing anymore, and then you got to figure out, oh, my diet, or oh, I'm going to take more supplements or whatever. No, no, man. 
Just switch out of your phase, move into another one. Now, here's how I like to phase workouts. Here's how it's written in MAPS Anabolic. There's a really low rep range that I think there's a lot of value in. This is like the one to six rep range. Um, you know, you're going to get benefit from all of that, kind of that low rep range. Then there's the eight to 12 rep range. This is the traditional kind of bodybuilding rep range. And then there's a 15 to 20 rep range. So those are, those are three. Now, those aren't the only ways to phase your, your reps, but those are the three general applies to most people categories of how you should phase your training in terms of rep ranges to get your body to continuously progress. Absolutely. And with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download our guides. They're all absolutely free. Um, and uh, you can find us all on Instagram. You can find Justin at mindpumpjustin. You can find me at mindpumpsal. And Adam, he's at mindpumpadam.